Yeah, so hello, Fast North. Uh, this is uh, me, Istvan Smoshansky, and my co presenter, Bela de Fox. Uh, uh, a bit more about me. Um, if Istvan Smoshansky sounded a bit too harsh, uh, you can just go with Flocky. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I'm a web developer for like a long time longer time than I uh, want to admit. Uh, I've been doing a, a lot of uh, JavaScript lately. Uh, I really like doing JavaScript on the hardware. I work with uh, different uh, hardware projects, so I'm, I'm very, uh, very bummed that I have been missing yesterday's workshops. Uh, Emma and Fries have been uh, tweeting really cool things that you have been up to at the hardware workshops yesterday. And uh, I'm uh, a Mozilla tech speaker. That's all the blue colors and hearts, uh, and it, which is like a community program for Mozilla uh, to empower contributors to speak at conferences and spread the good word. Uh, I also work with the DevRel team at Mozilla, uh, spreading the good word about other stuff and managing community and developer events. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing a bit more about that, uh, I can help you hopefully with that. Uh, this is a uh, this is a new talk. Um, I haven't really been giving uh, talks on AV1, but it's uh, very underrated and it's very cool. So I decided to to take this one up and try to uh, try to uh, introduce you to this technology that that you probably never heard of. But if you are fussy people. Uh, and a huge fan of free and open source and uh, uh, that kind of stuff. This is probably going to be interesting to you. Yay! Uh, all right. Has anybody heard of AV1 before? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you will find me outside. Uh, all right. Great. So, what is this thing? So, we'll have to start a bit. Uh, a bit um, uh, a bit, a few years back, uh, quite a few years back, uh, to like figure out what is AV1 uh, for. I can tell you that it's a video codec, and you could uh, have probably read that. So, what does Mozilla and what do I have to do with uh, AV1 or and the video codec in the first place? Uh, that's a very good question, and for that question, uh, you have to know what Mozilla's mission is. Mozilla's mission. Uh, even though you might know them from the Firefox web browser, uh, Mozilla's mission actually states that uh, what Mozilla is after is to keep the internet as a open and accessible public resource accessible to everybody. And when you get to that point, it actually gets very interesting because uh, the, uh, the web browser itself is not the only thing and the only way uh, to access uh, the internet these days. And uh, the internet has grew big enough, large enough, that you actually need uh, uh, to tap into other ways and other um, um, unvisited borders uh, and, and uh, other journeys that you will need uh, to keep it open and accessible for everybody. Uh, Mozilla took up a uh, project, uh, uh, joined forces with the XIF Org Foundation. Uh, if you have ever listened to an OGG audio file or have heard of the Vorbis format, uh, Mozilla had been trying to uh, make sure browsers implement the Org Vorbis format uh, and uh, to put those uh, formats into the browser. Why? Because it was very important for Mozilla to be able to have a uh, audio uh, file format and audio codec format that is free to implement and free to use by everybody uh, mm -hmm. and uh, consequently that can be accessed on every single platform that browsers exist on. It, it took a long way, it took a long time, uh, but eventually um, they created a codec uh, called um, uh, uh, created a codec called Opus uh, that you can uh, see on the screen. That was basically an amalgamation of two codecs. One is a very uh, uh, is a internal research codec uh, of Skype that was called Speaks, 
uh, that was very good at transmitting audio at very low bit rates uh, that human conversations could happen. And uh, they merged into this uh, Opus uh, format their uh, Vorbis for, uh, audio codec they had been working on, uh, which was very good at transmitting audio at uh, high frequencies and wideband uh, audio is like, like uh, stereo multi uh, multi audio codecs. Now, uh, MP3 is already like pretty much patent free, uh, but it wasn't back then when all this started. And one of the reasons Whistle did this is that uh, uh, this format wouldn't be patent encumbered and those uh, and thus could be used anywhere and by anybody implemented in any browser or any other open source project. This was a huge success. Uh, um, Opus is now currently a standard and is uh, required to be in every browser. It's used in WebRTC, uh, so you can converse in WebRTC. And actually, it uh, became a better codec uh, than any of the paint, uh, royal, uh, any of the um, uh, proprietary formats out there. So you can see, like uh, the Opus's blue line. Uh, so Opus actually was a huge success that Mozilla decided that. Maybe I know I know uh, this this might be a this might be a uh, huge undertaking, but let's try figure out if we can do this with video again. Well, video is definitely a larger undertaking, so that's where Dalla came into the view. Uh, again, with the um, ZIF Foundation, Mozilla started this work to work on a video uh, codec that was uh, so different that was so. Uh, fundamentally different from uh, all the things that were out there uh, uh, on the market, uh, that it would, uh, by definition, not be infringing on any patents out there. Uh, so that uh, DALA uh, came out of this. Uh, DALA is a research video codec that Mozilla and, and ZIF, uh, uh, the engineers working on it, tried to figure out ways to do browser and uh, video encoding uh, in ways that wasn't really uh, like tried before, or like a completely different fundamentals uh, uh, that would enable them to uh, provide uh, a better experience and an open experience to people, uh, a good compression ratio, uh, but also a, a completely freely implementable format. So this is what the DALA uh, formats uh, wiki page states currently. The, thereafter, they sought a video format that's uh, free to implement and use and distribute to anybody, and one uh, uh, that has a reference implementation with technical performance superior to H.265. H.265 is HEVC, uh, uh, you might have heard of it um, in other places. Uh, it's currently like the state of the art of uh, the MPEG family codecs that you have heard of, MPEG-2 uh, or like uh, H.264, uh, which is uh, AVC. Uh, uh, this is like the state of the art of those, that codec family. Uh, so Mozilla put the bar very high saying that we want to make something open and, and uh, freely accessible, but also want to make sure that it actually beats uh, it HEVC at its own game. Uh, why did they do this? Why was it so important? Uh, well, uh, the internet, uh, this is Cisco's database. Uh, the internet uh, con uh, contains a, lo uh, a large amount of content uh, of all shapes and forms. Uh, but what's clearly visible, so if you have a look at the internet video bar in this, so these are the uh, petabytes per month. Uh, of internet traffic. Uh, this is Cisco's data and projection of how this uh, petabytes per, per month is going to grow. Uh, now, the, it's, it's not really like, it doesn't really say a lot to say, you know, it's 42,000 petabytes per month uh, uh, video data transferred on the internet. But when you compare it to web, email, and other data, which is 9,000, that means uh, video already outweighs uh, all other internet traffic uh, one, for, uh, one, one, one for uh, four. Uh, so it's like 70% already of the uh, internet traffic is already video. Um, and this is projected to grow. 
uh, to almost more, more than 80 percent of the internet, more than four fifths of the internet is going to be video data transferred. And obviously, uh, this happens all over the place, but also happens a lot in browsers. You want to watch Netflix, you want to uh, be able to watch cat videos on, on YouTube, uh, or you know, stream uh, your games to, to people, or like live coding as people do now these days on, uh, on uh, Twitch. So this is uh, bound to grow, especially because uh, we, are, we are coming up uh, to a uh, time where, for, uh, where uh, a full HD video is not enough, where 4K video is emerging, or uh, uh, 360 video uh, of, uh, with v VR and AR. Uh, so we are definitely going to be outgrowing the current uh, data uh, throughput uh, that current codecs can provide us. So this might be able to explain uh, why this, uh, why a need for a non-patent encumbered and uh, high efficiency codec arose. And it wasn't just uh, you know a thing in Mozilla. It actually was across uh, the industry, industry wide. Uh, people who were doing video, which is basically everybody, uh, uh, they decided uh, they, they were seeking a new uh, savior, if you will, a new hero uh, to save them from having to pay royalties and having to uh, uh, submit to uh, patent encumbered codex, video codex, and also to reduce their um, uh, uh, improve the compression of the current uh, video codex. So this is where the hero came uh, in the face of four, not this four though. Uh, <coughs> But this for uh, it was a Thor was a uh, experimental codec developed by Cisco, um, um, and they tried to standardize it uh, to be included into the browser uh, as a method of uh, video conferencing. Uh, Cisco does a bunch of vo uh, voice over IP systems, uh, so they were already super into uh, 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 this this whole. Uh, decoupling uh, and getting rid of royalty-free codecs, uh, so they already support all of op uh, Opus in all their vo vo voice over IP projects, but they also have like WebEx and a bunch of other stuff that they are doing screen sharing, video conferencing, and they, were, uh, they decided to do uh, something about uh, the codec situation. Um, that was one other thing, uh, it turns out uh, VP9 is actually a quite a uh, gruesome uh, handgun, and I decided not to include that into the slides. So, uh, by, uh, but VP9 is also a uh, video codec developed by uh, uh, Google. Uh, if you ever heard of VP8, uh, you probably have came across it as a open source and, and uh, freely usable uh, codec that's included into the browsers already as a mandatory technology that browsers need to implement uh, in, uh, for example, like video tags or uh, web, uh, WebRTC support this. Um, and uh, the problem with VP8 is, uh, first of all, it had issues with hardware uh, support, uh, but also uh, uh, the bigger problem with VP8 is it couldn't have been the only thing uh, because uh, H.264 uh, was also included as a mandatory implementable thing. Uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, Google was pushing VP9 uh, to improve on those uh, and managed to bring VP9, the new version of the, uh, their video codec, on par with HEVC. Uh, what happened later is all these people found each other. Hey, we are kind of doing the same thing. Why not? Uh, uh, why not try to pool our resources and figure out how to do this together? Uh, so from this, a very unlikely alliance came out of. Uh, this very unlikely alliance is called the Alliance for Open Media, uh, or AOM for short, and. Uh, that's, those are all, uh, those, uh, those folks you see here are all part of Alliance of Open Media. Now the interesting part is uh, you will find every single browser or uh, browser vendor, I would say browser vendor, but uh, now you know that these are browser family vendors mostly. Uh, so Google is here, so WebKit is there, uh, so Blink is there, 
uh, Apple is here, which is very surprising because they just announced that they are supporting HEVC and iOS in 2017. Uh, and this basically uh, goes um, head on uh, with HEVC, this technology. But you will see uh, content creators, hardware vendors, uh, uh, video, content, uh, video content creators, Video that actually announced support uh, uh, just recently uh, when the bitstream was finalized, uh, which was uh, last month, I think, uh, I think uh, around February. Uh, they just announced, uh, no, uh, the bitstream was fi finalized last month, and, but VideoLand already has support uh, for a a AV1 decoding, uh, which is uh, they, if, if, you have rem if you remember the opening slides, so this is how it looks like in its full glory. Uh, so on the right hand side you see AVC, uh, MPEG4 AVC, uh, which is H.264. And on the left hand side you see the same bitrate, 500 kilobit per second uh, AV1 codec. And uh, you probably don't see anything on this because of uh, slides and projection, but the quality is very non noticeable. And obviously like H.264 is like the previous generation uh, technique, uh, uh, coding technique, but uh, you don't have to believe your eyes uh, to believe that AV1 actually uh, manages to not just do a royalty-free and open codec, uh, but it can actually uh, create better compression performance. How much better? Uh, there was actually a um, there was actually a study at Moscow State University last year, end of last year. Uh, this also goes that because it was end of last year, it was using a previous version of the codec. And uh, contrary to, to what might seem interesting, actually the codec might have regressed since then uh, uh, in performance, but it's still safe to, uh, safe to state uh, that uh, the expected uh, gains over HEVC, which is like the state-of-the-art and next-generation codec uh, in the MPA group, is at least for uh, 30 percent. So uh, you can see AV1 right here at 55 percent, and you can see HEVC uh, uh, on the left and VP9. AP, HV, HEVC and VP9 are pr practically the two uh, bits that are the hard, uh, that are the best in this area. And then the far right hand side, you can see a H.264 and all the uh, previous generation uh, <coughs> video technologies. Um, now, like I said, like this is not just somebody like sitting at their computer and trying to do stuff. This was actually uh, at the media uh, graphics and media lab. Uh, in uh, Moscow State University, uh, but now that the bitstream is finalized, which has just happened, uh, which basically means the binary format is now not 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 non-changing, uh, we are going to have more and more uh, interesting results to come. Uh, how does it do that? How does it do it? AV1, what does what what does it uh, AV1 do to achieve this? Now AV1 is basically. Uh, uh, taking all these ideas from all these browser uh, vendors' uh, own uh, personal projects in video coding technology and brings it all together. It's basically a, uh, a strange creature uh, with parts of VP9, parts of 4, and parts of Mozilla's DALA uh, built into it. And when we, we're talking about video codecs, uh, like these strange creatures are basically uh, the, uh, different tools, different encoding techniques, different uh, ways to search uh, for um, uh, redundancies in the input and making uh, uh, figuring out how to reuse the re those redundancies uh, to make sure we are not uh, throwing uh, bi bits and bytes away. Uh, now it's uh, extra hard to do this, obviously, when you have all these vendors out uh, out looking for blood, trying to uh, get some uh, royalty payments from you uh, when you are infringing uh, some uh, theoretical patents they are holding. And uh, how uh, AB1 avoids this is actually uh, it is built from the ground up uh, with the notion that. Uh, it has to uh, not infringe any outside vendor's uh, uh, patents, and every uh, every supporter of the uh, the video codec. So all the vendors you have seen there, uh, they actually are pulling their patents and they are releasing this as as open and freely usable. 
so AV1 actually is like a collection of uh, almost 30 tools uh, to uh, encode video content into this bitstream I was mentioning that is a binary format uh, that is the, uh, the uh, encoded video format that you are going to be using later to decode. Uh, some of these tools, uh, so I'm, uh, like I said, I'm not a uh, video engineer uh, or not a codec engineer either, um, but uh, um, if you're really interested, there are a bunch of blog posts uh, uh, in the DALA project, how do you do this? Uh, the, uh, as I said, the DALA project was a research project, so you can actually look it up and there are plenty of documentation about their experimentation of trying to create something out of scratch. Uh, that was not infringing other ideas, basically. Uh, uh, and a bunch of those ideas actually made it to the final AV1 codec toolchain. So uh, the chroma from Luma filter uh, is a, uh, one of the more interesting and more easily understandable pieces of uh, this technology, which basically, uh, uh, this was also uh, in uh, Paris talk before, uh, as uh, she mentioned that uh, uh, lightness is actually uh, uh, very uh, easily perceived by the eyes and the differences in, uh, in lightness of the screen. So this is why video codecs uh, primarily encode this uh, and only encode uh, color information as a uh, secondary, uh, less uh, detailed data. Uh, so the uh, chroma from Luma filter actually does this uh, when it actually reuses the chroma, the lightness values, uh, and tries to predict the colors uh, from uh, uh, from previous frames of the video. Uh, you already have um, uh, a predictor for the lightness of the of the frame, and it uses this l uh, predicted lightness. Uh, uh, to uh, to create a chroma channel, which is like col colorization of the the block. Uh, 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 this is one of the the uh, experimental code, uh, experimental tool set uh, chains that the Dala project contributed to the final Avian tool set. Uh, the other interesting one is the constraint directional enhancement filter. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that it actually is, uh, uh, is two filters uh, meshed together. And so it uses da uh, one of the DALA projects, uh, the ringing filter, and it uses uh, another filter, the Lopez filter, from the Tor project, which was the Cisco project. So the interesting thing is uh, from this cooperation, it turns out, uh, the actually when you implement uh, and um, basically they fuse the two filters into, uh, into one step. Uh, so they, they, they took uh, the, the ringing filter and added the Lopez fil uh, filter into the, same, uh, it's into, into the same step. Turns out this actually fixes a bunch of issues uh, uh, in a, pot uh, this is a post filtering phase. Uh, so these filters are used when you actually predicted uh, from your data, uh, how, should, uh, how your video frame should look like, uh, these uh, filters operate on that uh, generated output and try to fix the artifacts that were uh, generated by the encoding process. So what this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, joint filter does then, it turns out it actually uh, uh, creates a better uh, output, uh, which is just a you know, no, uh, way to say, you know, the signal noise ratio uh, drops. So that means it creates a better view and a closer approximation of the original image uh, when these two filters are merged together than if they are used like separately. So if you only use one filter or you only, uh, or you only use uh, Cisco's filter, for example, but also, if you only use Dallas filter and then apply the other filter, uh, which is super interesting that how uh, uh, big co cooperations like this could produce results completely unexpected uh, to the engineers. So again, like you don't see too much, uh, too many changes in this, uh, but there are uh, some comparisons that uh, highlight how, uh, how well this could actually uh, operate on the um, 
uh, on the designs. There was a blog post about this in the DALA filter. Interestingly, uh, the DALA filter, uh, so DALA uses lapsed transforms, uh, which is uh, something quite new in the video, uh, um, in video encoders at least. And uh, they were quite worried because uh, these last transfers generated some artifacts uh, that they were worried that uh, is going to uh, jeopardize the whole operation, that uh, they're, they're going to screw it up. And actually, uh, when this whole merging happened and they had a look into this uh, low pass filter of Cisco, uh, it turns out it fixed all these like uh, artifacts that remained after the, uh, the process. There's a very nice blog post about this on the DALA uh, project page if you want to learn more about it. Um, and there's one more thing that I wanted to talk about just briefly, uh, which is the AOM analyzer or the AV1 uh, bitstream analyzer which is also something that was worked on by this joint group of engineers and was a thing uh, mostly contributed by Mozilla, uh, which is basically this tool. This is an in-browser tool uh, that uh, people could use uh, to compare different inputs and outputs uh, encoded with different versions of the early uh, encoders. So uh, if you want to actually check this out, I'm going to send you a link. Uh, uh, so you can actually uh, um, have a look at earlier versions of the encoder and compare to uh, encoded video streams using different encoders uh, in quality. And this is what uh, engineers used. So there is a blog post uh, about this uh, uh, called the AVM1 Bitstream Analyzer by the creator Michael Bebenita, who works on Mozilla Research. Uh, where he explains all the, uh, the things why this is super cool. Uh, and this is also one of the reasons why it's super cool, because it's just a browser tool. So they were actually running like comparisons, sending links to people uh, uh, for visual tests, uh, manual tests. Uh, how do you like this picture? Which one you like better? Uh, they could actually send these to pictures and gather data uh, that they couldn't uh, uh, that they couldn't gather uh, using uh, uh, mathematical tests uh, like signal to noise ratio and stuff like this. Uh, but the other thing is, and we are getting to the uh, uh, to the to the part where okay, so this sounds cool, but what is the catch? Uh, the other thing is. Uh, because it takes a long time to encode video uh, frames uh, using the research uh, encoder that we, uh, we currently have. It actually, uh, when, they do, uh, when they do this, they actually use like huge clusters of computers in the cloud uh, to encode different sample videos uh, with newer, newer and newer versions of the codec as they were devel developing it. Uh, this actually resulted in a problem that they actually wanted to be able to work on these encoded streams uh, centrally. So this was also what, uh, what, uh, what brought to life this online AV, uh, bitstream analyzer. And just a word on the royalty mass that we have here uh, is there is, uh, uh, well, for all the reasons why this is super important, this, uh, this technology could be super important even uh, without the gains in, um, in the encoding performance. Uh, this uh, technology alone would be saving at least $100, $100 million just for Mozilla alone in uh, licensing fees, uh, which also goes for other big companies. And if you, have, if you just type into a, uh, a search engine, uh, HEVC uh, royalty or HEVC patents, you will see that, that the patent situation about HEVC has turned even worse than it was for AVC. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, this is actual uh, huge problem in the industry. It's not just not uh, having to pay hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for codex uh, and for the use of codex, but also not being able to predict how much you will have to be paying because anytime uh, somebody can pop up with a bunch of patents under their, uh, 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 under the floorboards of their grandmother, and you know, uh, they, uh, they can sue you for using and infringing those patents. Uh, so even if uh, like the performance wouldn't have been that cool, uh, this would be a, a huge boon uh, to a lot of the companies uh, not having to uh, play, pay these royalties. 
So just a few cl uh, closing things uh, about, okay, so how this sounds very cool, but you know, where's the catch? Well, the catch, first of all, is availability. As I mentioned, uh, this has just entered the uh, 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 bitstream phase. That means uh, you have a non-changing uh, binary representation of encoded bitstreams, uh, but encoders and decoders and hardware devices are still yet to come to the, uh, to the market. Uh, it also comes with uh, a problem about encoding performance because uh, they have been trying to uh, churn the maximum out of the encoder and not really optimize it. Currently, this takes about, this is about 200 times slower than the VP9 encoder. That means when you're trying to, like for example, they actually demonstrated live streaming uh, in, in here, uh, but they actually had to use, I think, uh, like a 200 CPU cluster to be able to, to do like a, uh, a full HD video live stream. So, uh, but uh, li like I said, hardware vendors are, uh, are in the AV, uh, AOM. So uh, actually we are expecting uh, uh, hardware support to arrive pretty soon uh, and also um, uh, software support for devices. This should be in, in browsers by the end of the year uh, at, uh, as long as the decoding part goes. It actually is in Firefox already. And just one more ver uh, word on the decoding part. So currently uh, decoding actually is pretty good. Uh, you can just use a normal computer to decode a uh, 1080p stream uh, in, a, in a desktop browser. Uh, Firefox actually has a version that, uh, the nightly version actually includes that you can, uh, a option that you can enable this. Uh, but uh, the problem is hardware decoding is not there. Uh, right now, because this is a completely new technology, that means uh, it, it is going to be problematic for stuff like uh, draining your battery uh, on your uh, laptop if you want to watch a you know all all the episodes of uh, you know, your favorite series on a long uh, flight. Uh, this might be a problem, but in a few years this is going to be resolved, uh, and we are expecting experimental hardware to come out very soon. Uh, and actually, uh, Netflix, for example, is already planning to, to uh, provide experimental uh, streams. So, and uh, this is going to be in Firefox and Chrome very soon. Chrome already ships VP9, so it's going to be a, a small step for them. And if you want to know more, uh, Michael, uh, Nathan Nagy and Michael Bevanita just gave a, a, a very good uh, presentation about this. So you can just check that out in the link. Click uh, when I. Sh uh, when you go uh, check out the slides. Slides are not yet online, but they're gonna be uh, online here when I push them live. Uh, Mouse Hex is tweeting about all the stuff that Mozilla is doing, uh, like cool stuff on the research division and the developers doing. That's me, and this is a kitty compressing itself. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>